How many of you actually got into programming because you wanted to write games? That's what I thought. No one wants to do database apps, do they? Yeah. When I, was, uh, when I was a kid, I got a ZX Spectrum, and all I wanted to do was write games all the time. And that's carried through my entire life, basically. But when I left uni, I probably did what everybody else did. I got a job doing database apps, writing user interfaces for desktop apps and all that kind of stuff. And it doesn't really fill your soul when you want to write games. About four years ago, I was uh, working in, in this kind of environment. <laughs> We've all been there. And um, I got chatting again with an old friend of mine, Dominic, who's actually in the audience over there. And he said to me, he said, Dean, I need your help. I need someone to do an Android port of Monogame. I thought, hmm, that kind's got game in the name. It should be quite interesting. So I started working on it in my spare time. I had a family as well, so it's quite difficult to balance all that. And after a couple of years, I was on the core team. Android team was ported. Uh, the Android was, was ported, and that was nice. Um, and Dominic, had, in the meantime, had moved on. He'd got a job at Xamarin. And I have to admit, when he told me he got a job at Xamarin, I was polite on the outside. But I was quite jealous on the inside, actually. And he contacted me. He said, Dean, there's a, we've got an opportunity here. They're looking for some people when you get your CV in. So I sent my CV to Dominic, who then passed it up to Miguel and Nat. And the next thing I know, I've got an interview with Nat and Miguel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a good day. That was a very good day. And 30-minute interview with each of them. Uh, next thing I know, I've got a job at Xamarin. It's like a dream job. It's a dream come true. So if you want to take anything away from today, I think it's that if you use or contribute to Monogame or an open source project, it can actually change your life. Uh, with Monogame, you can reach more people, reach more users, be on loads of platforms, and maybe even you can get your dream job. So how many of you actually know what Monogame is? Who doesn't know what Monogame is, actually? Who doesn't know? Hey, we've got a couple of people. OK, Monogame is an open source XNA framework. A few years ago, Microsoft had this lovely framework called XNA, which was great for uh, hobbyist developers. It allowed them to get games onto the Xbox 360. And what a game did is we took that framework and we made it cross-platform. We put it on the iPad, Android, and various other platforms. And we actually got it onto the Windows Store before anyone else. Um, the XNA wasn't on the Windows Store, so we actually ported it over to that as well. Um, but obviously, there's a lot of frameworks out there. You know, there's a lot of popular gaming frameworks, so why would you actually choose Monogame over anything else? Well, I think the primary reason that I would go with it is because it's open source. A lot of the more popular game frameworks that you could use don't give you the source code. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, you're using their editors and their runtime, and if you hit problems, you can't fix them. I have a good friend of mine, Steve. He's on the core team of Monogame, and, but he works in the gaming industry as his day job. And he's constantly tweeting stuff like this. Personally, I don't like living in that kind of environment. If you've got a tool that you're using and it's got bugs and hacks that you have to use, you know, hack around, that's not good. It's not good for your soul. So if you do look for a gaming framework, I'd go with the open source ones every time. The other thing that we've got is that it's obviously an easy to learn API. The, the XNA API was very well designed by some smart people at Microsoft. And uh, this API is so simple to use that schools and universities in the UK actually use it to teach students how to program. Uh, there's a university first year courses, they get people that don't know how to program at all, and they use this API because it's simple, it's easy to pick up, and it keeps the students engaged because they're writing games. Also, because Monogame is API compatible with XNA, all the resources that Microsoft have, and all the blogs and the samples that they have are still valid, so you can still use all of that information 
to uh, make games. There's also a whole bunch of tools and uh, engines that are built on top of XNA that a lot of people are porting over to Monogame that you can actually use as well. So there's a load of resources out there. And you can reuse a lot of your code. Most apps, they probably you know, share about 60% of their code, business line apps, um, unless they're using Xamarin Forms, of course, in which case you can share a lot more. But with Monogame, that number goes through the roof. And despite appearances, there's a lot of 2D games out there. Monogame actually does 3D as well. Uh, it's got shader support, so it's got quite a few advanced features. And the nicest thing about it is it's free. It doesn't cost you a thing. Obviously, there's licensing implications for if you want to target iOS and Android. But apart from that, it's the actual framework itself is totally free. And I did mention, it's actually open source, yeah? So I did mention that. Don't forget that. That's a super important point, that one. So when I was putting the presentation together, I thought, you know what? I could sit here and drone on for a couple of minutes about all the titles that have used Monogame, but that just sounds boring. So I'm just going to show you uh, the games themselves and let them speak for themselves. OK, this is the pop quiz side of this part of the uh, presentation now. Can anyone tell me which company uh, this quote is from? I know some of you in the audience know. Yeah? Supergiant, yeah. Uh, this is a great example of how um, the XNA framework managed to get people recognition on a, on a global scale. Before Bastion, no one had ever heard of Supergiant games. Um, and they've obviously gone to, they've produced Transistor now, and it's a really popular game on the PS4. Uh, they use Monogame and Xamarin iOS to, to obviously move this to iOS. And uh, they've obviously used Mono again to get it on the PS4. Uh, no, it's not on the PS4 yet. It's Transistor that's on the PS4. OK, next one. Anyone know what this one is? There is a hint on the, on the slide. Probably know the game, but you probably don't know the company. Yeah, go on, Kenneth. Yeah, that's the game, Stickman. Draw a Stickman Epic Adventure. Uh, and that was by HitSense. And Jonathan Pepper's actually giving a talk uh, this week, so check that out. He, he, they took an app to the Chinese market, and they've got some unique stories to tell about that. Um, this particular game is, is, is a great example of some of the code metrics that we've got. 95% code reuse. Just think about that for a second. 
Literally, the only code that they had to do that was platform specific was the code that actually started the game in the first place. The rest of it, all the rendering, the shaders, all the physics, all of that was shared. Uh, there aren't that many apps out there that can, that can get that kind of code reuse. Uh, it's another one. Does anyone recognize the game on that one? No, Fez, that's another popular title. This one was actually ported to uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac. And this is a good example of how the open source community works really well. There's a guy called Ethan. He forked MonoGame. And he's produced a, an SDL backend for it rather than using OpenTK, which is what we usually use. Uh, and that allows him to target all Windows, Mac, and Linux with kind of the same binary. Uh, and he can do that because it was an open source project. He wanted to do something slightly differently. So he forked it, and he's got his own version called FNA. And the, the great thing is that we still actually share stuff. So he still takes stuff from one game when we put in some nice fixes, uh, and we do the same. So there's a, a nice community spirit there. And finally, this one, does anyone recognize that game? Skulls of the Shogun, yeah. Uh, this was by a company called 17-Bit. And this is, another, again, another example of uh, the open source system working very well. When they produced this game and they ported it to Android, uh, they, they came to me in my spare time and, and said, we've got a little problem because we've got loads of graphics and we're not entirely sure it's going to run on Android. Because at the moment, in mono game, Android can't use compressed textures or anything like that. Uh, it just uses raw textures. And they had a real problem, so because the, the graphics just blew the graphics card. It was just too much. So I worked with them, and we actually introduced, the tech, we introduced a, a texture compression system. And they're actually going to, now it's working on their game, we're going to get that back into mono game as well. So we're going to benefit from the fact that they did the work on this to get it onto another platform. So obviously, mono game has been about for a while. Um, the core team's been very busy the last couple of years, this last year, doing various things. Uh, the first thing you're going to notice is we've got a nice brand new logo. Uh, they ran a competition uh, with a bunch of designers to, to pick a new logo. And uh, I think it looks pretty cool, which is good. Another major milestone this year was uh, the port to PlayStation 4, which was done by Sickhead Games, uh, which uses the Xamarin PS4 port. The Xamarin imported mono to PS4, so uh, the mono game stack sits, sits on top of that. Uh, this is the first time with first console that mono games actually got onto. And so that was a big, big thing for the project. There's obviously been plenty of bug fixes. Those of you who use the Android port uh, will know that the Android resume bug, which was the, the bane of many developers, <laughs> was, uh, was finally fixed. It was one of these annoying bugs where if you had a phone call while you were playing a game, and you took the phone call, when you came back to your game, you had sound, you had touch, but no graphics. And they just all disappeared. But that was fixed this year. Uh, and, and that was also fixed as part of the Skulls of the Shogun port, because they had a, a big problem with that. Obviously, documentation uh, is another thing that's been going on. Um, NuGet or Pickle, or whatever Miguel wants to say, that's going to catch on, isn't it? I know it's going to catch on. Um, and finally, uh, the, the most work has been gone in, going into the content pipeline. Now, a lot of people don't actually you know, care about the content pipeline, but there, there's a really important reason why we wanted to implement a content pipeline. And that's because now we don't need XNA. Yeah, clap. That's fine. You can do that. <laughs> So to build a game, you just need the mono on Windows, you just need the mono game installer. That's it. All the tooling that you need is going to be installed. You don't need to install VS 2010 and XNA 4 SDK. You just don't need it. So that, that's a huge thing for us. I want to take a minute and actually talk about the content pipeline, because so many people don't actually realize why they need to use it. And there's one real principal reason why you should consider using the content pipeline and that's performance. By pre-processing your assets, you can actually optimize them for the platform that you're targeting. 
Now, XNA used to do this for you, uh, but the simple thing for XNA was that it was targeting, say, one kind of platform, which is the Xbox 360 or the desktop, and that was using the same kind of texture compression. Whereas, obviously, we're targeting a lot more devices like that. Now, it's your job as developers to delight your users. Um, I'm paraphrasing Xamarin here, because it's our job at Xamarin to delight developers, but it's your job to delight your users. And giving them optimal and performant apps is extremely important, especially in the games industry. The, the bar is so high, if you've got a, a game that has even the slightest frame rate problems, it, you're going to get bad reviews and people will notice. So let's take a, a quick example of, of why you might why you need the content pipeline. This is a, a little character in a game. Um, he's, he's named Xander. Uh, and if it isn't, it should be, I think. Cute little guy. So we've got a 1024 by 1024 RGBA image of Xander. Uh, we want to put it in our game. Now, if you do the, do the math, that's about a 4 meg raw, data, raw pixel data you've got there. Now, we can save that as a PNG, because you can use PNGs when you want a game. You can just load the PNG and draw your graphics, and that's fine. And that'll save you some space on the disk. I mean, in this particular case, it was about half of the space. So it's about two meg um, for that particular image. But the real problem with that is there isn't a graphics card on the planet that actually knows how to use a, raw, a, a PNG file. It, they just don't know. So in order to use that PNG, we've got to decompress it from a PNG into a format that the graphics card understands. And in this case, it's the raw format. Um, so you end up using 4 meg of your graphics card. And the thing is, you don't really need to, because every graphics card supports a form of texture compression. And there's lots of different types of texture compression. Uh, on iOS devices, there's a, a type called PVRTC, and that's specific to the, chips, the graphic chipset they use. On desktops, it's uh, DXT, which uh, is like a DirectX standard, and all the major desktop graphics card manufacturers, they support that. On Android, you've got a whole bunch of them because you know, they've got so many different chipsets in use, it's unbelievable. So if we just take this image and we run it, say, through a PVRTC com texture compression for iOS, that's what you get. So that's like half a meg. And the interesting thing about that is that, that half a meg is, is on disk, but it's also in the graphics card, because the graphics card understands how to use this. You can just take it, load it, give it to the graphics card, and you're done. And because of that, you can obviously get a lot more textures in memory. So just the summary of why you should be using the content pipeline. Faster loading times, because you're not loading, two, you're loading, loading say, half a meg instead of two meg, which is obviously going to increase your loading, uh, decrease your loading times. Package sizes were probably going to be smaller. Um, if you start using techniques like MIT mapping and stuff like that, yeah, those packages might, the graphics might get a bit bigger. But generally, they'll be smaller which means you can use more graphics. And this goes back to the reason why Skulls of the Shogun needed this texture compression, and that's why we've got the image there, is because they just had to have it. They couldn't use it without it. But the, texture, the content pipeline isn't just about textures. It's about audio and all the other stuff. Uh, so you, and there's some hooks in there that allow you to do custom pre-processing of assets. I was working on something a few years ago, and it was a 3D model uh, bump mapping system that I wanted to do. And there's lots of techniques out there where you can do the bump map, it, do the calculations of the bump maps and binomials and tangents on the shader or on the CPU. Uh, but you're better off pre-processing this stuff. So I wrote a, an XNA, at the time I was using XNA, I, I wrote an XNA content pipeline extension that pre-processed my model and calculated the binomials and the tangents and saved them as part of the model format. And then we just load them at runtime. And that saved me having to do that stuff on the device. And even though we're talking about powerful handheld devices here, they're, they're not as powerful as desktop machines. So you always have to bear that in mind. And all of this kind of stuff, all this performance stuff, is going to make, end up with happier users because they're going to get better games. There's no frame rate glitches. And you'll be able to include more graphics uh, and various other bits and pieces in your game. So definitely take a look at the content pipeline. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to give you a quick demo of, of the tooling that we've got in Mono Game now. All of this is available. Um, it's actually available in the stable installers. 
there's a, uh, there is an unstable installer which has some fixes in it, which I put in last week, uh, which make things a little bit easier. So hopefully, here we go. So I've got, an, I've got a project here. It's just a, a chase camera demo, uh, a chase camera project that we tend to demo. It's got a little ship that flies around. So if we just have a look, um, I've got some pre-built XMB content here already because uh, it's a demo. And you know, here's one I prepared earlier for the Brits among you, good boy, Blue Peter. So what we'll have a look, we'll have a look at this MGCB file. This is the control file that we use to build the content. Uh, the way the content system works in, mono, in Monogame is different from XNA because we have a command line utility called MGCB that does the hard work rather than a project type in Visual Studio. This gives you a, a, gives you a lot more flexibility. It means you can use continuous integration to build your content uh, and various other bits and pieces. So all this is is just a command file that tells the content builder what it wants to do. So you can see, um, those of you who are familiar with XNA will remember texture importers and processors and all that kind of stuff, and being able to set whether you're pre-multiplying alpha uh, and all these things. So this is just a text file. You can hand edit it, but we do actually provide a tool. This is the uh, Monogame pipeline tool uh, where you can actually manage this content file. So you can actually create a new one or open an existing one. Uh, and from here, you can add new items. So we've got some templates in here, so you can add sprite fonts or XML content. Uh, and this is the actual content file that we're just looking at in Visual Studio. So if I have a look at this, um, you can see down here, we've got all the processor settings, like you'd expect, similar to, very similar to what you had in Visual Studio for the old XNA project. Uh, and you can also change the platform, because obviously we support a lot more platforms than, th than they did. So if I switch this to Android, and do a rebuild. You can see it's, it's cleaned up and then it's actually gone off and, and built the content. And take note there, uh, this has detected that we're doing texture compression. And I know I said that Android doesn't, have, doesn't support compressed textures at the moment, but what it can do, it can decompress the DXT format on the CPU and send that up. That's something we're gonna fix in, in the future. But the point here is that the content pipeline knew we were building for Android and has picked the right texture compression that we needed. So if I switch over to iOS and then rebuild, you'll notice that it's used PVRTC instead because, it, again, it knows that that's what you need for iOS. So you can actually use this tool now. Um, as you notice, I haven't gone into X and I haven't gone into Visual Studio 2010. Uh, this is actually produced XMB files, and the XMB files are binary compatible with XNA, so you can actually use this tool to build your content for an Xbox 360 game as well, if you wanted to. So let's have a quick look at this demo running. Yep, we've got that. We're gonna show off the... Uh, show off the Xamarin Android player. Who was happy about that announcement today? Yeah? That was good. Okay, that's not good. Yeah, we'll come back to that. But we'll do the iOS one. I didn't pray to the God of Demos this morning. Actually, just run it up. <laughs> so there we go. There's um, 
there's the app actually, actually running on the iOS emulator, which is quite cool. I think we'll just actually, I'm just going to show, we have it installed on the Xamarin Android player, so I'm just going to restart that. Because we've got to show it off, haven't we? Here's an app I prepared earlier. There you go. We've got a 3D game running it, running in the Android player. And all of that content was built, obviously, without the use of XMA, which is, is the main point that you want to uh, take with you about the content pipeline. So the next thing I want to talk about is what's happening with Monogame, uh, where it's going from here. Uh, the first thing we're going to try and get in is uh, Windows Universal Project Support. And this is quite important because uh, at the moment, if you want to target Windows Phone and Windows Store, you have to do two separate projects. But this, this should allow us to produce one game and one, one binary that will work everywhere. Uh, more console support. We're obviously on the PlayStation 4 now. Uh, there are other consoles out there, I believe. Uh, and it would be lovely to get Monogame on those, so that, that would be a nice thing. That's like a on the wish list. Uh, we'd like to get on all the consoles if we could. We're going to improve the unit tests, uh, make sure that we, we catch regressions and various other bits and you know, bugs and all that kind of stuff. And obviously, there's another project underway for WebGL, uh, and that's going to allow you to run Monogame apps in the browser, I believe. So that's... That's going to be an interesting project to keep an eye on. Documentation, documentation and tutorials are obviously always uh, on the go. And uh, obviously, bug fixes. Yes, it's an open source project, and we're developers, so we make mistakes. So yeah, we're going to, uh, we're going to fix bugs as they go. And if anyone actually wants to contribute, and if you find a bug, it'd be nice for you to, to help out on that. And also, uh, we're going to port the pipe, content pipeline for Mac and Linux. Yeah, there we go. That's good. I've been working on it the last couple of weeks. Um, do you want to see it? Yeah? Do you want to see it? OK. Let's have a look. This is very much a work in progress, by the way. Just warning you now. So this is the user interface that we're working on at the moment. It's very similar to the 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 one in Windows, we're, we're playing with the layout to see if we can uh, make, it, make it nice. This is currently based on GTK Sharp, so this should work on Linux as well, in theory. Uh, currently, the only thing missing that isn't working on Mac is shader compilation. That's going to take a little while to do, but at the moment, um, in the stuff that I've got here, we can compile bitmaps, sh uh, sprite fonts, 3D models, and audio. So if I just um, like do a rebuild, you can see we're getting the same kind of output as we were on Windows. Uh, you can, we've got the, the property editor over here, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, and you can change your platform. So this is very similar, and this is actually working. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to uh, the same sample that we had before. This is the, exactly the same sample. Uh, we've got the assets. Those are the XMBs that I've just built. And we'll just run this up in the emulator. I should have shut that down.
And there you go. It's the same game, all the content built on the Mac. So I haven't had to go near a Windows box at all for that. Uh, hopefully, um, I've, got some, I've got some PRs. Uh, hopefully, that'll be in the develop branch in the next couple of weeks. And you'll be able to play with it. So we're going to do a bit of a coding demo. I'm going to get my colleague Clancy to come up and, and demo some stuff. So we can just welcome Clancy. Thank you. Thank you. I just thought. I didn't yeah. tell you about the content pipeline, did I? No, no. All the stuff I'm showing you, no content, no content pipeline. Damn it. Awesome. Sorry about that, dude. It's OK. It gives me something to port to soon. All right. Is there any way we can switch to this other machine? So today I figured might as well actually, we've seen some of the stuff you can do. We've seen games that people have already built. But let's actually just like work on a game and, and build something while we're here. Um, everyone remembers the Flappy Birds craze. Um, do you definitely remember the whole, what was it? What was the copter one? Um, Flappy Copter? No, it wasn't Flappy no. Copter or whatever. <laughs> what, within like 12 hours it had 30 clones or so? But it was the... Yeah. No, ridiculous. It was, it, was, it was stupid. <laughs> but during all that let's get a clone out thing, I decided, you know what? We need a mono game version of it. So we have a little game here. Um, you guys might have seen the source. It's open source. You can go you can close some stuff so you stop getting notifications. Um, you know, you should have published it. I should have published it. But instead, I just put it out there so you guys can publish it. But Flappy Monkey. Yes, yes. Little monkey. Um, that, that's impressive, isn't it? Come on, guys. <laughs> That's, that's so, good. I think there's notifications to go away. All right. So, Flappy Monkey. Very basic. It's a great starting. To be honest, I'm, I love the style. It's very basic, very frustrating, but really, really easy to get going. There's not much to it. Um, a lot of the oddities that come, especially with mobile platforms, go away with this game. You don't have to really deal with much touch input at all. There's one option, tap. It's all there is to it, right? And I can demo sometimes go farther. But you see the point. There's nothing, nothing to it. You just tap. Really, really easy input. Um, let's look a little bit about how this thing can work. And I like this game because I was able to, we've moved this thing around. Let me, you guys cannot read that text, I'm guessing. So let's make it nice and big. There's some nice little things about this that I like because if we look, I have my shared project here, which this is the whole game. Um, I can zoom that in too, can't I? I can do that, yes. So there's the main game, my game physics class. I have a number. Oh, right, that's because I did number graphics. I just switched between them. Parallaxing background, a player, top scores, and walls. That's my entire game, six, seven classes. And most of them don't even count. They're so tiny. Zoom out. Yes, drawing images. The player is really tiny, too. A couple things on there to play, his interactions. Really, really, really simple game. And Why did you use share products and projects instead of PCL? Oh, awesome. Right? I was going to. Yeah. So Just kind of PCLs, people love them. I hate them. I hate them. I don't want to go into all the reasons now, but if you ask me later, I'll explain all the reasons I hate them. Um, shared assets, they're my favorite. Um, it's a technique that I've been using for a long time. I love file linking but I hated the work it took to do it. Um, shared assets are just really, really, really smart, smart linking. If I quit those, those will go away. That's bothering me, sorry. There we go. Go away, okay. Don't know why those stuck there. But shared assets are some really smart file linking. You add everything in here, it has no project type. You'll notice I don't have references. It just holds files, and when you click compile, it copies all those files to whatever's referencing it. Now, it's nice. You'll notice at this portion of my screen, zoom into there, it shows what project I'm actually now working against. And I can just switch, oh, OK, I'm working on the iOS now. And all of, the, all of my autocomplete will switch to as if I'm on iOS. Granted, for a game, you really don't want to put a bunch of platform-specific stuff in here. So I technically could go UI, or, or, or Xamarin, wait, I'm on. I think this one's the mo UI mono touch one. Right, yes, OK. I'm on 32 bit, not 64. But I could just go through and now go to UI kit and start adding UI stuff. 
and it's really cool. It just auto smart switches I switch between. But it's able, it allows me to quickly share a ton of code without being stuck to the con or being stuck in the confines of PCL. I can do anything I want platform specific. You can do dirty, dirty if defs if you want, and just have fun. So I love shared assets. They're my favorite. Isn't if def a dirty word? It can be, but I still like doing it. Okay. You'll, see, you'll see there's the right time to do it, and then there's the lazy time to do it, but we all do it. Let's be honest. All right. So a great example of when I did it, my little physics engine explains, this is, maybe it's not the best, best name for it, but the game physics class is how this game works. How fast do the walls move? How fast does the guy fall? Just every little thing about it. When you jump, how high does it go? So you can quickly and easily change and modify this game, um, even how fast do the walls come? Like, how fast is this thing gonna, gonna really mess with you? And I did do a nice little bad if def here. If I'm doing one of my TV platforms, make the gaps different, I should scale that and make it do something about the width because it was really, really impossible when I first put on the fire. The gaps were like this big and the monkey could barely fit through it. So. Actually, since I do, um, since I am so horrible with that, let's just change this a little bit and see. Are we gonna make it easier, are we? We're gonna make it a little easier. Easier. I think about demoing it a little bit easier. Is it still Flappy Monkey if it's easy? Absolutely. It's Monkey, know. not Bird. We're good. Oh, okay. See, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Oh, and I still <laughs> mess up. So, <laughs> Flappy Monkey, the easy way. But, uh oh, uh oh, I actually got an argument is out of range. Uh oh, there's bugs, guys. There's bugs. You okay. should put insights in that. I should put insights in this. Yeah. There is no insights in this yet. Okay. So I have crashed my game. But I don't know why it did that. So there's pool, this is open source. There's pull requests. You can fix my bug. Someone can do it before the conference is over, or before this talk is over. That would be awesome. In fact, if someone could do it before the talk is over, that'd be great. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> um, but what I really like, like I just mentioned with the shared assets, is I can quickly use the same little bit of code. This is a really small game, total built in under eight hours. Um, it's nice when you know what you're going for and you're not trying to figure it out. So just threw some drawing together, put a couple game states and make the guy, I spent more time on that sign curve to get him to, to fall like I wanted than anything else. But really easy game. Now what's beautiful about these shared assets, um, you'll notice that each of these um, projects are referencing that shared. The same exact project from all four of these project types. Since I'm on the Mac, I only have, and I actually haven't spent the time to put it for Windows Phone, but I could move it over just the same. And I have the, the Android version, the Fire version, the iOS version, and even the OIA, and you can play it on there, and it's kind of fun to get it over there. But you'll notice that each of these only have one file that's different. The iOS has its own main file, which, Okay, that's what, really two or three lines of real code, the rest is just generated. Yeah. So a couple lines of code straight from the template. And then I'm also lazy when I build my Android versions, they all sit on top of each other. So they all share the same exact activity. The only difference is I need the main project to swap out which reference from mono game. If you wanna use the Amazon Fire services and things like that, they need different references. So they all use the same exact same exact project, different project GUID, and different references. So this is the code in, the, in that like 5% that Absolutely, I was in but I'd call this earlier, way less than 5%. The Android yeah. has more, because <laughs> I did build in for the Amazon, you have the nice little notifications that pop up, I built that in. But aside from that, we're back to new game, set it to an activity, set the content. Job done. So what, four lines of code on, I, on Android, three on iOS? Told you iOS is better. It's so, <laughs> really simple, really easy to quickly share a lot, of, um, a lot of code. This is all open source, if you wanna play with it. I saw someone made, their version of making it easier was they tied it into one of the fuel bands, I think it was, and if you took enough steps, the pipes got farther apart, so it made you be active while you play. Kind of an interesting, unique thing, and that's out on the app stores, but great, great small little sample on how to build something in mono game. Okay, so this is a cool one. But I'm gonna switch over to a game I've been building for five years? Five years? Five years. Pretty impressive. Um, long time. You're gonna be amazed at how complete it is for being a, a five-year project. I mean, I did that in eight hours, so what can five years do, right? 
So we're going to show this off on the Mac side. You're kind of bigging this up now. You know that, don't you? So what? You're kind of bigging it up. Yeah, I am, but it's amazing. I mean, <laughs> yes, there's my intro screen. If any of you guys have played with Mono Game, this is one of the samples. It's how it starts. And I, I'm just going to hit enter and yes. Look at that. Is that not amazing? Is that impressive? So the real reason it's been going on, what? Ah. Uh, Man, demo gods are not with me today. Why do I have Thank a breakpoint? Or I don't know what just happened. Is it? No, it's still going. I don't know why. I must have clicked something. But yes, the reason it's actually taken so long is I get very frustrated and mad at my physics engine, and I start over. So is that not awesome? OK. So is that all sprites, or is that? To be honest, there's only one sprite being drawn in this, and I'm going to delete it. This game is purely drawn via SVGs. Everything you see here, physics objects, drawing, all SVGs. It's eventually, it's going to look like this. Um, you can tell, can't you? It's really close. So I've worked a um, little story about this. It's a game I've always wanted to build. I started on it. Don't finish it. But it's, I love Atari. I, that was my first console. I loved the, the coolness of it. This is, it's just reminiscent of that, but with modern UI. And that's what's always been my fight. As I started going the physics route like everyone else likes to do, and I built this beautiful bike with the, like pedals, and I've gone through multiple iterations of this, and you can see that looks absolutely nothing like my current one. My new one is a box in a circle. Yes, <laughs> simple's better. I like the feel of this, and so I'm finally happy with my physics, so I might actually finish this. But as a hack knight, um, Xamarin likes to do hack nights. We've done a few of them a couple years ago, and most of the code for this is actually open source from one of our original hack nights. I worked on this with Dominique and Vinicius, one of our UI designers, and he built this, and you can tell we're almost there. It's getting close. And I think we're finally ready to finish this thing. Yeah. But some cool techniques, like you were mentioning, with sprites. There's no sprites. Um, I did a couple tricks. I used Farseer for my physics engine. And Farseer has some nice SVG parsing. First, I built my own SVG parser. And it worked really good. And we were going to go sprites. And we built, um, we were going to do SVGs for all the physics objects. Because then Vinicius could do them, all in, do them all in Inkscape. And he started tagging different things. And I was able to parse. And we just used his raw stuff. And it was really cool, because SVGs are so tiny. And there's no, there's no real assets to this thing. It's just a couple SVG files, glorified XML. And we got the parsing working really well that first day. We had physics objects drawing. Scaling was a nightmare. Um, I can imagine. Finally got past a lot of those. But yeah, SVG. So I used Farseer Physics Engine. Um, put that also into a shared asset project. I didn't feel like porting that to PCL. So my Farseer is, is also, um, it's also a shared asset. And then all the drawing, I'm a programmer and I'm a lazy programmer. I could have implemented a full SVG parser and full SVG drawing. But you'll notice the aesthetics of this game are so basic. They're all solid colors. So. Any physics engine you get normally comes with a debug view, so you can see how the physics are drawing. I added extra attributes to the classes so I could then type in the color. And so I grabbed the color from the SVG parser, and I'm just using the debug view. So all of this beautiful drawing and rendering, uh-oh, it's now actually did close. Oh, no, I was on the Mac one. I can run it on iOS, too. But all of the beautiful, beautiful rendering you're seeing there, it's a debug view. There's nothing. Special. I like taking tricks. I like taking shortcuts. That's pretty cool. I see nothing wrong with that. I don't that. think anyone's ever used the debug view to actually write a game before. No, but it's, <laughs> it it's be beautiful. It follows the, oh wait, I'm still on the Mac. It still follows that aesthetics I wanted. And for scaling, um, I ended up doing some little math equation that goes back and forth. And I just modify the camera based on width, and then I adjust the ground up and down based on everything. And I set it as the base of the width of the iPhone 6. Figured that was a, a good baseline. And I did that when I just rewrote it again. So let's start debugging this guy. And you'll see okay. it scales. And the nice thing is, I, the only graphic is the background just because I haven't rewrote that part yet. Oh, I'm on ad hoc. That's not going to deploy there. One set of startup. No, where's my set of startup? Let me switch to debug. We're going to get a simulator in a second here. <laughs> there we go. You'd think I'd know these products. 
All right. So while this is loading, any we questions? Anything you guys want to see? Questions? We're towards the end of our time. Yeah, we're, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So, any questions? There's a there's a mic coming that we can. Well, frameworks like Unity and stuff like that have a lot of content library. Do you guys have anything uh, equivalent to that? Like no, the three D. Okay, <laughs> I just wonder. <laughs> Okay. GitHub samples, there's lots GitHub of those. Samples. Um, there isn't a massive content library that you can use, uh, but there, obviously there are places where you can get 3D models, and there's um, open art, and there's open, open, game, art. open, game, open art game art as well. Art. There's a couple of sites where you can get, get stuff. Generally speaking, I find just when you're knocking up a, a game, it's best not to try and fixate on the artwork, because you never get anywhere. I, I've, I've hit that quite a bit. So if you just try and... Think, okay, I'll just do some rubbish graphics for now and get the, 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 the actual game working, and then I'll, I'll get a designer to come in and tidy or it up later. If you want graphics like this, contact me. Yeah. I mean, my amazing yeah. design skills, pixel art at its best, hand drawn. Aside from the monkey, I traced him. Yeah, or go, yeah, or go with pixel art because, you know, that's, that's easy. <laughs> yeah, someone come Yes. Here. Vectorizing an image of a monkey. I stole Craig's monkey and vectorized him. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say that uh, if you're looking for, if you follow um, Monogame team, uh, I tweeted a few uh, image resources uh, that are free. So, um, so if you go back through the history about a week, there's some links um, if you really want to use some sort of uh, uh, get, uh, art without creating your own. Okay, cool. Thanks, Tom. Any other questions? Yeah, there's one at the back there. How do you support uh, portrait to landscape screen rotation using mono game in your game? Uh, well, you can, um, the APIs are very similar to Windows Phone. But when, when XNA was ported to Windows Phone, that was another platform they did just before, it was Windows Phone 7, I think, just before they killed it. Uh, there's, uh, you can pick, hook into orientation changes. There's actually an event that you can hook into, or you can check the current orientation in your update loop. Uh, and you can, you can actually detect when, you know, when the orientation flips. And then it'll be down to you to make sure that you, you adjust your viewport accordingly, basically. You can actually lock your game into landscape or portrait as well if you want. Uh, a lot of games do that because... Um, this is locked. Yeah. It, <laughs> that, that wouldn't work in portrait. So that's why people tend to do that. Make a, make a design decision, this is going to work in portrait or landscape, and then kind of go with it. But there are APIs that you can, you can use to hook into that. Uh, there should be some samples on how to do it. There's actually a sample on the uh, XNA Creators Club, I think. So it's per perfectly possible to do. Okay. What was that uh, bicycle model you were demonstrating oh, in physics? Yes, so that's one I actually followed a tutorial somewhere else and then modified it. This is Rube. It's a box 2D editor, but I'm using Farseer for my physics, so I had to write a parse. It spits out JSON, and then you just convert the JSON into, into objects. This is just Rube. It's pretty. It's nice. You can see it running. I spent so much time on this bike model, and then I trashed it multiple times. So, Dude, where's his sweet. head? He doesn't have a head. It's, <laughs> I, kinda, I had it on at one point, but on this version, he doesn't need a head. Okay. He just falls off a box anyway. Well, he definitely hasn't got one now. So, <laughs> Any um, other questions? Anyone else? Oh, oh yep. Box 2D works great. If you add the Cocos 2D, so the question was, what other physics engines can you use? Or um, Box 2D. Comes along, we added it with uh, Coco's 2D or is Coco, Coco Sharp? Sharp's Coco Sharp, get them right. Coco Sharp is, we did a bind, we re implemented it in C Sharp on top of Mono Game. And it's, there's some talks on that. And those, that uses Box 2D. It ships with Mono Game, Coco Sharp, and Box 2D already in the NuGet package. So, Box 2D's, uh, Coco Sharp is quite good actually. The talk's on Friday. It's a higher level API. It's got scene management and you know animation and all that kind of stuff. Kind of things that Monogame doesn't provide by default because it's a Monogame's a very low library. But uh, Coco Sharp sits on top of it. So it's, it's definitely worth a look if you if you want to have a look at that. I think the talk's on Friday. Yeah. Also, or, shameless or plug, Friday there's a talk on testing games in Test Cloud. I'm so if be you're there. interested in games and you want to see how to test your games on hundreds of devices at once, 
it's really impressive to see them all run on Test Cloud. Yeah. So we'll go through some of the techniques on how to do that and why you should and what you shouldn't care about. Yeah. Fun stuff. Cool. Any others? Yeah. There's one on the back there. I just get uh, a lot of requests about why I have to use, uh, why I'm not using Unity 3D. And uh, yeah. What you get? Um, why what, you what's the main difference, and what can I tell the people that Mono Game is better than Unity 3D? .NET 3.5. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's a big <laughs> one. But I, I always say that um, it's more of a, a, a it's a personal choice. I've I've tried Unity 3D, um, but the the way they put games together didn't really fit into my brain properly. I'm a coder. I'm not a drag and dropper. Uh, when it comes to that kind of stuff. So, I mean, Unity, it, it's a good engine. A lot of people use it. Um, it's not open source. Would be one of the main reasons why I wouldn't use it. Uh, so if you do hit a problem, uh, unlike many of the games, like Bastion, they've got their own fork of Mono Game. They've done tweaks for it. Uh, Skulls of the Shogun have, you know, all these people, you, you just can't do that with, with that kind of engine. Uh, it's always nice to have the source code. And, you know, if anything does happen to that company, What's going to happen to it? If it's open source, you've always got it. So, personal choice at the end of the day, but they some reasons that might yeah, might work. <laughs> okay, I think we're done. Thanks a lot. Oh no, one, one, more, more. One, more, one more, one more, one more, one more. Last one. Last. <laughs> Are you planning to extend the uh, API of uh, XNA and? Uh, develop some uh, new features or you're planning just yes. to maintain? We're going we're gonna to take it further. Um, geometry shaders is on the list. It's, it's not in, on the immediate list, but that it'd be nice to have some kind of geometry shaders stuff in there. Uh, and it'd be nice to extend the API. We might eventually, a lot of people have little utilities that they, they wrote to get around some of the deficiencies in the API. We might start bringing those in. So it's... We're getting to a point now where we've got compatibility with, uh, with XNA4, and it's getting time that we start you know, moving it forward again. So get involved. <laughs> if you've got a feature you want, you know, let us know. OK. Thank you, Thanks guys. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Drop that HDMI. <laughs>